Tonight, we continue our exploration of our magnificent human brain with the consideration of President Obama's new brain initiative. The president announced in April the new effort which seeks to revolutionize our understanding of the human brain. He has described the initiative as one of his administration's grand challenges for the 21st century. The project has drawn comparisons to the Human Genome Project as well as President Kennedy's 1961 challenge to land a human on the moon in 10 years. Two National Institute of Health directors helping to lead the initiative. Join us now. Story Landis is head of National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Thomas Insel, head of National Institute for Mental Health. And with us are Cornelia Bargman of Rockefeller University and William Newsom of Stanford. They are co-chairs of the advisory board for the initiative. And once again, my co-host is Dr. Eric Kandel. He is a Nobel laureate, a professor at Columbia University, and a Howard Hughes medical investigator. I am pleased to have all of them at this table. And so we begin once again with my colleague, Dr. Eric Kandel, to give us a look at what we might include in this program as we look at this initiative. Welcome. Charlie, you outlined it very well as always. Uh, so today we're going to look at the Obama Brain Initiative, which is designed to get a better understanding of the human brain. The human brain looks simple enough. It weighs about three pounds. And if you look at the image on the screen, aesthetically pleasing. It looks like it would not be very difficult to understand. The fact is it's the most complex object in the universe. Uh, it makes us who we are. It's responsible for every behavior, every thought, every action that we carry out, from the simplest automatic behaviors like breathing and swallowing to walking, running, and cognitive acts like planning, thinking, creating works of art. But how one moves from those higher mental processes to understanding how the brain mediates that is an extraordinarily difficult challenge. I think most scientists consider this the greatest challenge of the 21st century. In fact, one can argue it's the greatest challenge science has ever faced. You mentioned putting a person on the moon, the human genome. These are enormous accomplishments. They don't compare in complexity. They pale by comparison. They pale by comparison to this. This is an extraordinarily difficult task. And this is, as you pointed out, what President Obama appreciated when he announced at a press conference in April that several of us attended, that this is the next major American initiative. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, NIH. And I am proud to have the honor of welcoming you here to the East Room of the White House for a very special scientific announcement. So without further ado, it is a great personal privilege and a high honor to introduce our scientist-in-chief, <laughs> the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Ideas are what power our economy. It's what sets us apart. We do innovation better than anybody else. And that makes our economy stronger. And every dollar we spend to map the human genome has returned $140 to our economy. One dollar of investment, $140 in return. So Dr. Collins helped lead that genome effort. And that's why we thought it was appropriate uh, to have him here to announce the next great American project. And that's what we're calling the Brain Initiative. You know, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away. We can study particles smaller than an atom. But we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. So as a result, we're still unable to cure diseases like Alzheimer's or autism or fully reverse the effects of a stroke. So there, there's this enormous mystery uh, waiting to be unlocked. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. And that knowledge could be, will be, transformative. Imagine if no family had to feel helpless watching a loved one disappear behind the mask of Parkinson's or struggle in the grip of epilepsy. Imagine if we could reverse traumatic brain injury or PTSD for our veterans who are coming home or if millions of Americans uh, were suddenly finding new jobs uh, in these fields, jobs we haven't even dreamt up yet because 
We chose to invest in this project. We can't afford to miss these opportunities while the rest of the world races ahead. We have to seize them. I don't want the next job-creating discoveries to happen in China or India or Germany. I want them to happen right here in the United States of America. And that's part of what this BRAIN initiative is about. We have a chance to improve the lives of not just millions, but billions of people on this planet. As President Obama made clear, the BRAIN initiative is a very ambitious project, and it has a number of partners, both public and private. The public partners are the NIH, the National Science Foundation, uh, and DARPA, the Defense uh, establishment. And the private ones are the Allen Institute, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Salk Institute, and the Kevney Foundation. Uh, these have their independent leadership, but the coordination is going to be provided by the National Institute of Health and its director, Francis Collins, with the help of uh, Story Landis and Tom Insels, director of the National Institute of Neurological Disease and the Institute of Mental Health. The NIH has also appointed an extraordinary scientific advisory committee, the best people in the field, and co-chaired by Corey Bogman and by Bill Newsom. So we have around the table four of the major leaders of this effort, and we will see what the aims of this effort are and how we're going to achieve it. Now, despite the fact that this is an enormous challenge, we couldn't be in a better position to take it on. And this is for several reasons. <clears throat> One is, as anyone listening to the brain series would appreciate, neuroscience has not exactly been sleeping for the last several decades. Exactly. There's been an enormous progress, although we have a long, long way to go. History. For example, in simple animals such as worms and flies and mice, we are beginning to understand how sensory systems work, how motor systems function, how they interact with one another, and we understand simple forms of learning and how memory is stored. In complex animals and primates, we're understanding cognitive functions that don't even involve movements of the body, thinking, planning, acting. We understand this and we're beginning to understand this in various levels. So why is this useful? Evolution is conservative. Once we work out how a biological problem is solved, the chances are components of it are going to be conserved. So this is going to provide background knowledge for understanding the human brain. The second point is that in order to make advances, we need technological developments. And I think it's fair to say that we've never been in a better position in terms of technological developments than we are right now. <clears throat> when I began in neuroscience a mere 55 years ago, we recorded from one cell at a time. Now we can record from several hundred cells at the same time. This is necessary, but not sufficient. We can also act, ask, how are they interconnected? How do they control behavior? We can activate certain patterns of neurons and not others. We can inhibit certain cells and ask, what is the consequences for behavior? This is a very powerful set of methodologies. Not only do we have physiological methodologies, but as you'll see, wonderful anatomical methodologies to see how the nerve cells are interconnected. Third, we're not alone in this project. There's a parallel effort going on in Europe. Right. has a very different purpose. It's designed to simulate the human brain with supercomputers. Now, the overall purpose of the brain initiative is to understand the normal human brain. But it's inconceivable that studying the normal human brain wouldn't have fantastic spin-offs for schizophrenia, depression, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. The list goes on. The tragedies of humankind. These are the kinds of things we ultimately want to understand. Yeah, it's, to me, it's straightforward. Uh, I came into this field uh, initially as a psychiatrist, then yeah. became a neuroscientist. I believe deeply that the disorders of the mind can be understood as brain disorders. That's one way to approach them. As biology? As biology. And circuitry. And so understanding them as circuit problems in the human brain. And I think that this project could ultimately give us the tools with which to improve diagnosis and develop new treatments. And that would be transformative. Charlie, I, I am not a clinician. 
And my father died of Alzheimer's disease recently, and so this is this is personal to me. Yeah. But but I'm driven by deep curiosity about uh, uh, what it means for us to be human. That's a phrase you used a while ago, and I think any of us who've lived on the earth for a few decades have questions about ourselves. You know, why is it that we engage in actions that hurt people we right. love, right, rather than build up people that we love? Um, why is it that we have such difficulty managing teenage kids, and teenage kids have such difficulty managing their their parents? Where does creativity <laughs> come from? More than you know, th th this, this aesthetic sense we have when we experience yeah. the beauty of nature, yeah. and and those that internal reality right, right, is right. built up of the electrical activity of billions of neurons. And I want to know yeah, how exactly. does that happen? What's the connection how between here and there, sure. behavior and 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 this internal yeah. mental life? What so, a mystery. What a great oh, mystery to solve. So for neurological disorders, we, for, for a number of them, have very good molecular understandings. We have genes that we know cause the diseases. We understand what the cell biological consequences of mutations in those genes are, and we think that those changes are relevant to, to cases of Parkinson's or Lou Gehrig's disease, which are not familial or genetic. But it's also very clear that circuitry changes when nerve cells die. So in your father's case, as the nerve cells were degenerating, there were s changes in circuitry which may have been compensatory and positive or may not have been. For example, Alzheimer's patients often have abnormal electrical activity, rather like seizures, and it's possible that some of the downstream consequences of neuron loss as additional neuron loss from hyperactivity. So if we understood the circuits and how we could potentially manipulate or modify them, I think it would be extraordinarily important, not just for psychiatric diseases, but for many, many neurological disorders. So as scientists, I appreciate enormously the medical importance of understanding the brain, but I think just understanding the brain is a great thing for itself. Knowledge is important into that, itself. That we're trying to understand the vocabulary of the brain and the grammar and ultimately how it can be used to write the works of Shakespeare, which is an immense human accomplishment. I'm a child. I was born in 1961. I remember a man landing on the moon. It was an incredible experience. It was a great human accomplishment to be able to do that, not just an American accomplishment. And I think one of the things that sets us apart is that humans do have science, and we have understanding and knowledge and art, and these things we do that are larger than ourselves. And understanding the brain is our grand challenge. It's what we should do. Yeah. That's what our president told us to do. It's actually sort of remarkable right. to be told by your commander in chief right. that what you do is important and you and should try. And how wonderful to sit yeah. there and listen, thinking, well, now, you know, if something awful happened to me, I've heard this wonderful request that we focus on yeah. how, how the brain, human brain works. Our scientist in chief. Our yeah. scientist in chief. Right. Uh, I have three thoughts, again, yeah. determined in good part by my personal experience. Uh, I was in Vienna in 1938 when Hitler marched into Austria. And I saw people who were my friends turn within hours to become my enemies. What are the social processes that turn people to listen to Mozart, Beethoven, and Brahms one day beat up the Jews the next? Mm -hmm. What are the social determinants? How does the brain act to make a decent human being an evil one, number one? Number two, um, creativity is a fit. Each one of us is creative to some degree. How do you enhance creativity? How do you bring it out in people? We know that under some circumstances, there are certain brain lesions. For example, you and I had an interview with Oliver Sacks and Chuck Close, both of whom are face blind, and both of whom are really quite creative. And you could see how aspects of the creativity might emerge from that. But there are some fundamental principles about creativity we will learn as we do this. And finally, if I may get personal, uh, you're no longer 40 and I'm no longer 60 <laughs> and we're doing amazingly well. You're at the top of your game. How does one ensure that one continues to be creative throughout much of one's life?